What? Yeah. Now I'm... Yeah, I'm behaving myself. I, no, I'm not playing in abandoned buildings. What? Again? Now. I suppose you had those people follow me again. Fine. Hey. This is Jimmy Farrow from Monty and the Farrow, and I want to thank all our subscribers. We have now passed 14,000 on our YouTube channel. But I want to ask our subscribers to take the next step for us and become a full-fledged member of Monty and the Pharaoh. Yeah, that's right, folks. There's three different levels to choose from. There's free shirts. There's free autographs. Just check it out and become a member of Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast, Monty and the Pharaoh. Later. Welcome back to Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast, Monty Nefaro, only seen here out of Indie Music TV, out of Ron Konkuma, Long Island. It's Thursday, and we're so glad to have everybody joining us today. Uh, we've got a spe very, very special show tonight with uh, guest Angel Amoroso. Nice. Um, nice. Uh, we'll introduce her in a, in a bit. Um, I'm asking people to listen to Angel. She's got a very interesting story, and please be prepared with questions before we get that, though. Jared, the new producer. There he is. Is this, is this show three, Jared? Three or four, yeah, around there. Yeah, I think we're past I was telling I was telling Farrow that you like the other shows better than ours. Would that, you that stop it? He that. does no, not. True. Jared. i the Farrow, obviously the best. There we go. Lies. Lies. <laughs> Spidey lives. Spidey's our man. Man, you love Spidey. I love Spidey. I do love Spidey. He's so cool and he's inoffensive. A, if the people could see him one what? day, we'll show him on camera. He's a handsome. Oh my God! A handsome. We are much handsome, compared to Spidey. Strapping <laughs> young man. If I was a woman, oh, would you please? Now we're taking would, it a little I, bit. If I was a woman, I'd ask him on a date. Spidey's a, he's a good-looking guy. He's better looking I'm than not me. Gonna, he's better looking than me. Really? That's the first time I ever heard you even... You, There's you're not lying. too many. You must be drinking. Why do you think I'm lying? <laughs> you're right. I've never, Spidey, ever... No, Spidey, no offense, I'm lying. I'm I've sorry. never, ever heard <laughs> the Pharaoh put anybody hey, over. Spidey, Spidey's... Hey, he's the man. We I'll like take Spidey. It, I'll take it. Hey, All right, so Pharaoh news this week. Oh, God. Sloth bear kills couple <laughs> and feasts on their remains for hours. A sloth bear killed a man and a woman in India before feasting on the remains for hours. Why am I laughing? The attack took place at a nature reserve uh, there you go. on Sunday as a couple walked back from temple, authorities said. Uh, this happened in India. Uh, Mushesh Rai and his wife Gudia, age 43 and 30. What are you laughing about? Somebody Gudia! Got, somebody got I'm eaten. I'm laughing at your pronunciation, Gudia! It's probably Gudja or something like that. Gudia. It's Gud Godzilla Gud versus Gudia. That's, okay, that's how you pronounce it. You know what? It. it probably is pronounced that way. Obviously. Age 43 and 39, <laughs> respectfully, were walking through a forest in India in right? the district of Indian state Madhya. Well, I guess that's the Madhya. name of it. When they accounted a sloth bear. The sloth okay. bear attacked them and started to feast and have a wonderful little dinner okay. on these two people. Is, is, and you laugh no, about well, it. Uh, first thing first thing in defense of the sloth bear. Go ahead. Was there any video of this? Did anybody videotape this attack? Did they provoke the sloth bear? This is a nature reserve. You are walking through the sloth bear's backyard and you're wondering why the sloth bear's like, what the fuck are you doing here? First, real quick, is that really a sloth bear right there? That's a baby sloth bear, and I picked that picture on purpose. He's it looks cute. very friendly. He's, he's that's what cute. I'm getting at. Could you imagine him feasting on your body? No, not at all. They must have pissed him off beyond belief. Beyond belief. He was like, what you Dude, talking about, bears. Willis? I didn't think bears 
eight people like that. I don't think so they either, but well apparently said. this was a hungry slot bear. Give some shout outs to some people in the Great. room uh, as we're getting going. We got Mitch in the house, What's Maria up, Mitch? Davis. Maria! We love you, Maria. Ooh, I gave her the ball Matthew hand Holland, which is what really is not his Matt? name, but it's we're going to say that. Name. No, he's always under someone else's name. Oh, it's he's all always good. Good. okay. Don the Barber in the house. We got JBO2. What up, my friend? What up, what Jason? Up? Always good to see you, yes, RJ. Sir. Great to see you. No, wait, I said, hold on. Jason? Like from. Like Jason Voorhees? No. Damn it. Come on, dude. I'm sure Jason Voorhees. Jason Mohing. Okay, that works too. I said that RJ, now you confused me. I so, did? You know, there you go. Wow. Well, anyway, back to the sloth bear. Yeah, what about the sloth bear? I'm very the innocent, cute sloth B40 bear. B40 in the house. Good B40. to see him, too. What we up? got a great show for you guys tonight. Oh, very ever, interesting do show. We ever. Uh, but first, I want to introduce the star of the show, Mr. Jimmy Farrow. Jimmy? I would like to introduce the other star of the show, Mr. Monty. How you doing, Mr. How Monty? How you doing, buddy? What's happening? It's always What's great to be here on Thursday. We yeah. get to see our friends. Absolutely. We get to have such great interviews with such wonderful people like Angel. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's our honor yes. to be tuned into every Thursday, and we truly mean that. So Life is good. thank you again. Life is good. And I want to thank the band that sings the theme. You know, <clears throat> one thing, you think people just get tired of the same old shtick? We've been doing it for about no. a year and a half. Consistency brings championships. Okay. Yeah. Good enough. Yeah. I'd like to mm -hmm. thank the band that <clears throat> sings the theme song for Monty and Faro, our own, <laughs> our own Jimmy Farrell, along with his partner, Bart Griggs, bring up the... Make up the band <laughs> with Stereo <laughs> Hall. Um, but Stereo Hall. That was really that was bad. A, that was a fail. That was a, epic. Man. See, it's gone. The with top level is gone. Oh, where's the beer? It's your fault. With Stereo Hall singing such great songs as uh, In My Dreams, This Life, wow. Far Behind, Here Comes the Rain. You can find their music on the Wisteria Hall YouTube page. <laughs> Please hit that like and subscribe. Also, Please. you can download the mo download their music on Spotify, yeah. Apple Music, yeah. and Reverb Nation. Yeah. If you didn't know it, you are watching Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast, Monty Nefaro. Catch us on the Monty Nefaro YouTube page, the Monty Nefaro Facebook Live wow. page. Well, Here's well, on the Monty, and the Monty Nefaro iHeart Radio, Spotify. Hmm. Anchor and the Monty DeFaro Twitch TV page. Yeah. And if you're lucky enough to live in New York, catch us on Channel 115 every Tuesday at 9.30. And Saturday at 11.30, we're going head-to-head -head with Saturday Night Live. In fact, we did such a great job against Saturday Night Live, half their staff quit. Half their staff quit over Monty and DeFaro? Well, they were failing. They were Boy, losing. They, they're fucking soft. And that's factual. Check the they're news. They're soft. They've lost. Yeah. They're Done. Soft. <laughs> Channel 20, Tuesday at 1 a.m. And we always want to thank Amazon Music, who's at us. So, again, if you... Tired of two old fat and fat? balding Leave old me guys. Out of this. Possibly balding. <laughs> you don't have to listen to us, but if you really like us, you can listen to us everywhere. Anyway, we, we're going to be back with our guest, former ECW valet and pro, S, pro wrestler Angel Amoroso. Fans, please get your questions ready. Absolutely. I ask first that you hear Angel's story first, listen to the questions, listen to the story, and then. Judge, and then ask your questions. Um, Most importantly, remember, folks, heroes are people, too. We will see you in a second. Tired of that same old, same old breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Same old tasting scrambled eggs, burger, that dinner steak, ribs, or pork chops. Why not add a little bit of spice? or just a touch of heat to make the difference. Change that scrambled egg with a little bit of Johnny Fabulous's John Cena Sr.'s Million Dollar Jalapeno Hot Sauce. Great on burgers, steaks, chops, and those barbecued ribs. Dino Luzzi Energy Drink. Yeah, it's that good. And Nitro's Garage for all your automotive needs. Call 646-675-2349. That's 646-675-2349. For all your automotive needs, Nitro's Garage. Ask for Jack. Hit it. 
brother. You be on the air. Like now. I'm on? Yeah. You be on. Oh, well, I'm you sorry. I'm looking at the screen, and I'm wondering <laughs> his, what's his going on because I look like I'm frozen again. Welcome screen. back to Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast. Monty Nefaro, only seen here out of Indie Music TV. Boy, I'm missing my cues tonight, huh? Ah, it's all right. Just improvise like I do. Anyway, I want to thank... Welcome, Angel Amoroso, to Long Island's number one pro wrestler broadcast. How are Hello, you? Hello, Jimmy. Hello, Michael. How Hello. are you this evening? I'm lovely. How are you? Well, let me just start by saying that I am... Uh, I just want to thank you for making me a part of your network on, on Wrestling Rewind. Uh, really enjoying being a host of the show, and I also really enjoy having Jimmy and Wisteria Hall as my entrance music, as you would say, and my exit music. You are so awesome. I love it. Thank you. Well, Thanks, I got to tell you, since uh, you and Tommy have joined the network uh, along with others, uh, the show has grown, and is, uh, in fact, you're very popular throughout the European countries. I could see how your shows are doing. I actually have to share with that your future on the charts. I meant to, I meant to actually share that with you. So thank you again. It's our honor to have you on our network also. Thank you. All right, so Angel, for people who may not know who you are, where you've been in the business, we kind of want to walk through your life from growing up, to eventually joining ECW and then onward. So tell us, where does Angel Amoroso grow up? And talk about your family. Okay, well, I grew up in South Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, it's a, pretty much a, a predominantly a, Italian neighborhood and area. Um, my my parents were, um, my mother is African American, my father's Italian, and I, I grew up with a brother and a sister. Uh, my sister's seven years older than me, my brother two years older than me. Um, we, we, you know, it was really kind of rough growing up. Um, I, I was the black sheep, of course, uh, it, more favored by my, my father who, uh, you know, you know, took me by his side to do all the things that he was doing as I was growing up. I, I wasn't schooled a whole lot um, because I was with him a lot doing uh, his business and the things that he wanted me to do, including um, apartment wrestling videos, uh, a lot of modeling, uh, underage stuff that uh, he used to drop me off to and I would uh, fight grown women and grown men, some strippers and porn actresses and whatnot, and he would drop me off at a hotel and while a video, people were videotaping me uh, wrestling and boxing these people and um, you know then they marketed these videos when I was very young and now these videos are still out there being marketed some of them are being given away for free on adult entertainment sites and they just keep changing the date on them and uh, you know selling them for minutes at a time I get no profit off of this and I, I know it's totally against the law and there just seems to be nothing that still I could do about it but uh, it, growing up that was my job that my my father uh, gave to me in uh, sort of like, you know, my beginnings in uh, an interest in sports. Uh, and, and it was like wrestling and boxing and uh, martial arts. I'm a, a trained martial artist. I've been doing karate since I was six years old. And, um, you know, it, that's the field he directed me in because he knew that I could make money. There were local people who were uh, using uh, local women who him and a lot of other people provided them. And I worked with the adults to make him his money. So, Angel, again, mm -hmm. respectfully, we have tons of respect for you, but there's there's probably a lot of questions we're going to ask that uh, we'll go back and forth on. But 
Is there any anger on your side that your father put you in that type of position? Um, to me, listening to that beginning of your story seems uh, abnormal and, uh, well, you were being I didn't think it was abnormal. Point. Why? I, I, I didn't think it was abnormal. Um, I, I never, you know, I, I didn't question any decisions that he made as long as he was happy about, you know, I was, I wasn't a very social child, you know, I, I, I didn't have like have friends and, and he was really the only person in my life. So I, I really didn't question whether or not it was normal or, well, you I know, guess I, I, would, I would beat did, up adults for him. Did you, that, did you, you know, question it later? And did, did you question it later? Did like, you start to think like maybe this was kind of a strange upbringing perhaps? It, 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 no, it took a while. Okay. It, it took a while. Okay. Um, uh, there, there was a lot of other situations where as uh, I was doing a lot of the, the wrestling uh, and boxing parts, the other girls who were doing it with me that were uh, the adult actresses and whatnot uh, were staying afterwards with the, the group of guys who would uh, sit around and watch the films being made because they would pay per person to watch us wrestle on mats on the floor. And then they would take the adult film stars and the strippers and have their private time with them per head. You know what I'm saying? Did this somehow lead you into pro wrestling? I mean, apartment wrestling is clearly very different than working for a company like ECW. I mean... Right. Well, oddly, um, you know, I don't, my, my father got me interested in wrestling. Uh, I, my, one of my jobs was somehow to duplicate pornography uh, for, for sales, uh, local sales. And um, he got me interested in watching wrestling on the side because it was something to distract me while I was home from school and not going to school. Mm. Um, so I started watching wrestling and um you know he started taking my the whole family to shows we all went uh, my sister my brother my mother even uh my mother was a big heckler and uh you know then uh, we we got he knew promoters he knew dennis carluzzo very well okay so um you know they were like best friends him he knew gino moore who was a, another a, a promoter who was around the nwa um so we joined a fan club early on uh and you know i was a heckler in in the audience i always got front row and i was a big giant heckler so i would you know really taunt the boys when they came out to the point where it would be disturbing because i had a really big mouth and i it was like i was stealing the show i guess mm. so um you know i i got a lot of attention like that as as a fan i guess um, it, it, we joined a fan club that went like it was Rassel Radio fan club it run by Joel Goodhart, which was the original, like, a, you know, TWA, the original ECW, if you want to call it that. Okay. Um, he had a radio show at the time and a fan club that would travel all across the country. We went as far as like we went to Virginia for like Starcades and for, for the NWA. And, and as far as like Memphis for USWA wrestling uh, in Barnes and stuff like that, uh, you know, we did a whole Tennessee tour. And this was in in 1988. I was 13 years old. 13. 13 years old. Okay. So um, I'm sorry. In, yeah. In in Richmond, actually, the Richmond Starcade, uh, my friend Jack always reminds me, it was November of 1987. So technically, I was 12 years old, I mm, guess. Okay. Uh, so I was traveling uh, around, and, you know, and meeting people after shows and everything because we were a group. So, you know, we met a lot of wrestlers at luncheons and, and dinners and stuff like that that the, the wrestling radio would hold for, for these particular guys, you know, whoever they were. Um, so uh, it, w with the fan club, it came like, you know, I, me and my sister would go to the, the host that, who was uh, Carmela Panfield. She was a woman, the female host, and uh, we would go to her house 
on the weekend with and all the independent wrestlers and anyone from the local schools like Monster Factory and Dominic Danucci School and wherever would go to her house. So and anyone who was on a show at the time. Now we're talking in the eighties. Right. Uh, you know, right. the eighty eight now, them mm -hmm. like thirteen years old. And the the first encounter that was negative that I had had was a, around her group, um, Dominic Danucci had wanted to train me and my sister to work for him. He was uh, training Sh uh, Shane Douglas at the time, okay. and Mick Foley was up there with him. So he wanted to train me and my sister, and I had an incident with him in her basement that she witnessed and kind of turned a blind eye to. Uh, you know, he he grabbed me and, and it, like mauled my face and was kissing me and, and told me if, if I could use language, I, I'm not sure what kind of language Absolutely. I can use. So it, he took me by the back of my head and forced it between his legs and said, look at my dick, you know. And I I was kind of horrified by it, but it, Car it, you know, Carmella came in and she said, you know, what's going on? And he brushed it off like it was nothing, but it kind of like it discouraged me to want to be trained by him. I would think so. Uh, oh, can, I, can, I, can I stop I think, you there one second? So. Right. So sure. we get a picture of this. You're 12 years old at this point? Uh, you're 12 going on 13. Going and, on 13. and your sister is 19? Yes. Yes. Okay. So let's go back a little bit. Your father's got you doing this apartment wrestling stuff. Where's your mom during this whole situation? My mother, uh, she continued. My father had an incident at one of the shows where they – stretched him out he had like a heart episode and uh he asked dennis to keep an eye on dennis carluzzo to keep an eye on me and uh from then on dennis kind of kept an eye on me uh like for a long time my mother uh continued going to shows with me and my sister as and, and my brother as far as memphis and then allowed a very well-known groupie to talk her into letting us go on the Great American Bash tour with her because she had some extra seats and she wanted me to sit with her because you know I was sitting across the other side of the ring and she always had like a Bruce Springsteen secretary sat with her and uh, different interchangeable groupies at the time that were around for a long time and uh, then I came along and she asked my mother if she if me and my sister to go on a tour with her and my mother uh allowed it knowing that i was not gonna you know go to school that year or anything mm. like it was a great american bash tour it, thankfully was during the uh summertime so i wasn't missing any school then but during then the the school year that came next uh, it just like <laughs> so it, going it, back to the danucci thing at 12 years old going on 13 obviously you knew something was wrong that an older man like that would say that to you, correct? Uh, I was I was disgusted. Um, I, I wasn't. I was really confused because the background is on the Memphis trip when I. It, this was like you know uh, back and forth. I had a boyfriend, Tom Robinson. Uh, he does a podcast as well, and he was kind of in independent wrestling. I started dating him before any of this happened. At 12 years kinda, old? Yeah. Yeah. He was like 19. Oh, so and my, 19 you know, dating mom, a 12 year old. Yes. My mother, my mother met him in Memphis and everything and knew him and everyone knew that we were dating. Mm -hmm. So, and my mother made it really clear to everyone how old I was like on the bus in Memphis because, uh, there was a politician who was uh, John Brozicelli from New Jersey who was bad mouthing me on the bus, uh, telling everyone, you know, making up stuff about things I had done when I had just gotten there. Um, so, uh, you know, my mother pretty much okayed for me and my sister to go on the tour with these women who were, you know, very well known to be doing what they were doing. They got promoters passes. They traveled, uh, you know, from Philly, all the way from Philly and everywhere up north as far as Chicago and, so you know. Could, could, without being south. disrespectful, could we just call them ring rats for this conversation? Yes. I, yes, absolutely. Okay. Yes. 
I say groupie as in, uh, you it. know, respectful terms to them right. because I actually still do communicate right. with them. Okay. Um, you know, so, but yeah, uh, all, all very well known, well traveled ring rats with every, everyone and anyone you can name, uh, up until maybe not even 10 years ago, <laughs> they were still circling around some of them. So. Now, do you turn to your sister at 12 years old or 13 years old, who's a 19 year old that's watching over you and Dominic Danucci did this and do you say anything to her like, how do you let this happen? Or oh, she was she was always very bitter uh, towards me, and uh, you know very jealous. In it had a jealous streak, and and would you know if people were giving me that negative attention, that would then lead to something that was inappropriate. Uh, she and she would get mad at me and take their side, and and you know try to flip it around like I was doing something wrong. To antagonize because I was a kid I was being fed drugs and alcohol and I was drunk and I was being brought across state lines many state lines uh, during all days of the week and all hours of the night I was up with these people in their in and out of their rooms and they were in and out of my room because I shared a room with these groupies and um, you know there was no solid supervision and you know really nothing but encouragement from the rest of the the group that i hung around to behave the way i was so i really didn't um I, it personally when the things happened to me with people i felt like it was wrong but then when i would go to them and tell them you know uh so and so just you know, I, I was laying there, passed out. I couldn't move, and he, you know, jerked off on my face and left the room. I see. Who's this? I see him. Who's so this? Bobby Fulton did this. Bobby, Bobby Fulton, Fulton did this to me uh, in in uh, Crystal City, Marriott. Uh, he had I you know, I had watched Ric Flair dance on top of a table uh, after the bar closed, and I was totally smashed. And I went to the room that we had rented, and I was puking my guts up, and I was laying on a bathroom floor, and I, you know, I know that he he had come in with one of the other girls, and obviously something didn't work out, and the next thing I knew, he was you know tilting my face and jacking on my face like it, and I couldn't move and there was nothing I could do but I seen that it was him so regardless of how he wants to try to defend himself now when I go at him on social media um, it, you know only God knows how many people he probably did that to and whether or not you remember it I remember it fucking so crystal clear it's so like yes babe. angel so, big bus Fetty out there and and this is the same question I'm sure everybody's got. Where are your parents at this point? Oh, oh no, this is uh, once I went on the road. I was just with my sister and uh, five to seven interchangeable groupies that were uh, worked for the stock exchange and the Pentagon and had different, very important jobs. Not stupid women, very educated women. Um, I, I was left in the care of these women to travel. So you're training with Danucci. You explain no, what happened. No, I did not train with Danucci. Not after, not I, well, I, I, I understand. After that. I just, not after but, that. Yeah. but I'm sure that we've had Shane Douglas in here and Shane trained with Danucci. Right, right. Mm -hmm. this was when, you start that the, when you start to meet these older wrestlers, right? You're 12, you're 13. Everybody's older than you. Yeah. Is yeah. there any type of father figure that you kind of encounter that you feel like, like you can speak to? Yes. De Dennis Carluzzo was uh, was there for me the minute my dad left, and he was there for me until the day he died. You know, Dennis was, was the only person who, you know, Dennis then took me along, you know, when people were done training at the Monster Factory, Dennis took me and my sister over to Larry Sharp and you know we would learn the basics there 
because you know Dennis was more like family to me and Dennis looked after me and I didn't have to you know with Larry initially you know there there's always some kind of problem but Larry was always good to me and um, respected me as I grew and uh, taught me things to not only be like you know a, a fucking bobblehead in in the business like you know to fulfill every position I could you know and and he, he taught me that in a way and we didn't have to be around people to learn it so and I, I seen Dennis as you know my figure that I could depend on all always he was my best friend uh, he knew everything that happened to me during my childhood um, a lot of times him and Gino Moore uh, they, they were my ride you know uh, to a lot of events so uh, a lot of stories about Dennis and Gino, I have, I could just go on forever, you know, uh, but they were there for everything. So then everything. I ask you this, did you turn to Dennis and tell him that this thing was happening to you? Well, um, as much as I love Dennis, um, you know, because it, Tom Robinson, uh, my previous boyfriend, was also one of the, you know, the kid marks, he would yank around a lot. So uh, Dennis, actually um, knowing what I had previously uh, been through, like I start going to hotels really early and, you know, at the bars afterwards with the wrestlers and everything and getting grabbed by people like Tully Blanchard and, you know, making out, you know, and jerking off all over me. <laughs> like, you know, he, he knew about like, you know, the stuff that had happened and, it, but he then knowing what had happened, um, it did direct me towards people like Dave Meltzer at, at a very young age uh, because he fed Dave Meltzer along with a lot of other of my friends uh, fed Dave Meltzer on what was going on personally around, uh, you know, after shows. And Dave Meltzer was really just, you know, letting loose in his newsletter back then, telling people a lot, a lot of, lots of stuff that was not wrestling stuff. It was like personal and backstage stuff. And it was usually like me or my friend Jack Andrews or Dennis Carluzzo uh, feeding Dave Meltzer. So uh, Dennis introduced me to Dave Meltzer then at, at a very young age of, of, of 12. And um, then after feeding Dave Meltzer for a while, um, you know, me and Dave became involved in uh, a, real, a sexual relationship, regardless of what his weird ass wants to say. Uh, he, he knows what he did. So, uh, yeah. So Dennis did get me involved with Dave Meltzer, which um, I, I, I do regret. And uh, then again with uh, Stan Lane. He had brought me backstage when my father had the episode and uh you know sat me down in the locker room and him and cornette were consoling me and then that same night when i went that you know stan lane was like oh you know let's go get something to eat and we'll take your mind off things and blah 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 and that same night we did not go get anything to eat we went to a red roof inn and had sex just to, you know? just to be clear <laughs> this was on a border of like 12 and 13 years old like that's yeah. what i wanted to make clear if, okay so dave so Meltzer. dave Meltzer, the, the the captain of shit talking uh yes you know i just wanted to make something clear okay i'm good <laughs> so oh boy Again, this isn't victim shaming. I'm just asking the question. At 13 years old, do you not know that this is wrong? Or is it that you love all these guys this much because you love the sport? Like, at what point do you not say, like, this isn't right? Uh, I, I was, I was kind of, you know, I was confused. I, like I said, I started drinking and doing drugs really, really, I like hard drugs, not, not like, oh, I smoked a little pot or whatever. Like I was taking pills and snorting Coke and doing a lot of stuff that, you know, n normal kids like don't do on the road. They don't wake up and, and go to bed with beers on the side of their bed and, uh, you, you know, never ever sleep and are like you know insane like I, I i was never the type i was never a child 
I was never treated like a child. I was never put in the position of a child. Mm. Um, I never acted like a child. I never behaved like a child. Um, I didn't know what childhood was. I didn't consider uh, age groups. I just, I went along with whoever I was put along with as per, I was not welcomed too much by my family at home. So wrestling, uh, that was like, that was my family and, and the people in it, the groupies were my family. The promoters were my family, the wrestlers who I was having sex with on, you know, on every, on every show, uh, you know, they were my family. That was my family. So did I find it unusual? Uh, I found it unusual when I was being smacked around and choked by people while I was having sex with them, or I was being, uh, you know, literally raped by people and uh, spit on and abused. Yeah, I did. And later on, I did find that to be unusual. And that's how I ended up, you know, leaving that area of wrestling. But before I did leave that area of wrestling, uh, there was a miscommunication with me and 20 plus grown ass wrestlers who should have known better to not fool around with someone that they knew was a child. All right, they with knew. that, we're going to take a quick commercial break and then we're going to talk about your entrance into ECW, okay? Okay. All right, we'll see you in a minute. The Monty and the Pharaoh Show is brought to you by... Because wine is your second favorite four-letter word. California wine, New York attitude, good fucking wine. Yeah. Do you treat your dog as part of the family? <laughs> well, so do we. So why not celebrate your pup's birthday with the ultimate party box? Check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Party Pup Info, and let us make your pup's party or any celebration perfection. You want to star in your own success? Call QuickCast, www.quickcast.com, 866-7-CAST-NOW. That's 866-7-CAST-NOW, QuickCast. Star in your own success. <laughs> That's right, folks. Canine Corral for all your dog daycare and overnight care. Call 631-549-1544. That's 631-549-1544. Jimmy, I gotta take a dump. What? No. I mean, I need a dumpster. <sighs> well... For all those needs, you need to call Big V Dumpster Rental, Long Island, New York, 631-900-DUMP. Hmm. Hey folks, this is Wolfie D here, and if you are looking to buy or sell a home in Tennessee or Southern Kentucky, you're going to want to call my buddy, the rock star realtor, Benji Bowie. And you say, Wolfie, how do I get in touch with this rock star? Well, you can call him directly at 615-390-8216. You can go to his website, BowieHomes.com. That's B-U-I-E Homes.com. Or you can email him at BenBowie34 at gmail.com. B-E-N-B-U-I-E-34 at gmail.com. When you need a home, you need the Rockstar Realtor. Tell him Wolfie sent you. Benji is a member of Exit Realty's Garden Gate team in Gallatin, Tennessee. All right, welcome back to Long Island's number one pro wrestler broadcast, Monty Nefaro, seen every Thursday at 9 p.m., where we have a special guest, our honor, Angel Amoroso. Thank you, Angel. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. All right, so a lot of the fans, they haven't heard your story. You're kind of blowing their mind. 
Um, to be expected. By which the way. is to be expected. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's bounce a little bit. When do you decide, hey, I want to be involved as a wrestler, and how does that start? Okay, well, uh, after my, uh, my, young, uh, my young childhood experience, mm. uh, you know, later on, the, one of the last people that I was with was Eddie Gilbert, who encouraged me a lot in becoming a wrestler. I was 15 years old at the time, and I worked a show with him and probably the whole cast of the NWA uh, Jim Crockett group. It was uh, the Tom Robinson benefit, if anyone wants to look that up. I was 15 years old on that show, and uh, that was my in-ring debut. Uh, Previous to that, I had worked shows at 12 and 13 or 14 for Dennis and Larry as a, you know, ring announcer and ring card girl, and um, it different the things that I did for them, but Eddie Gilbert encouraged me uh, at 15 after that show to actually, you know, get myself out there. So uh, after that, several months after, was a birthday party of which, you know, it was supposed to be my 18th birthday party at the hotel we all would gather at. And the promoter, Gary Juster, had, you know, cornered me while Arn Anderson was mauling me and uh, <clears throat> told me that he thought that I would be a perfect fit to work for uh, Todd Gordon's ECW at the time was Eastern Championship Wrestling. Mm-hmm. And this was in 1992. So we're, we're talking way back. And, um, you know, he sent me to Todd. I went to Todd's office uh, the next day and talked to him about, you know, what they would expect of me. And, you know, Todd laid it out of what would be expected. And, um, you know, then I was booked on the next show, which was the Super Summer Sizzler Spectacular, in which Eddie Gilbert wanted to prove a point to Dusty Rhodes. Long story. It was about women, you know, always threatening to be naked at the end of matches, and it never actually happened in wrestling, and it never would. So uh, in comes me three months uh, after my 18th birthday, advertised as an adult film star, and uh, got my top ripped off in front of uh, about 300 people, um, some kids, most old ladies, uh, just it, the first incident of, of nudity in wrestling. So that was my introduction to ECW during a cat fight. During, um, a, it was Tigra and Lori Fallington, who was known as Peaches at the mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. That's a hell of a start. Did you, uh, when you were younger... Uh, did you ever lie about your age to any of these wrestlers so nope, they all nope. knew your age? I, I never lied about it. My sister at one point actually tried to make herself younger and call herself my twin, which she did a lot. People called us the Amoroso twins when we were younger. Um, you know, So she actually tried to push her age down. To, to get to me. Um, I did, like, when I went in bars and whatnot, I had, I was walking on the arms of wrestlers, number one, so no one was questioning an ID when you had, had that, and a room key, and a set of tits. No one really questions you at the mm. bar. Bouncers don't look past this right here. As much so, as you were obviously being taken advantage of by a lot of these guys, at what point, or if, because I, I don't know, did you become any, at any point emotionally involved? Like, did you fall for some of these guys and they just hurt your feelings? I mean, at what point do you become emotionally involved with these wrestlers? Well, this- yeah, because, uh, you know, I, I, I was very young and I did not have friends outside of wrestling. Sure. It was it, literally the only people that I was around. So right. when I did, I did form bonds with a lot of people and uh, specifically people like Paul Heyman who would go out of his way to communicate with me in between shows that we were always, uh, you know, on the road with NWA. He was working and I was a rat, but we were, in a lot, you know, we were always on, you know, at the same 
place, same time sort of thing. And he was very encouraging as well. Um, of course, in, in different ways, in, in sexual ways, uh, and, and then in personal ways, in, in between wrestling, he would always communicate with me and fill my head, uh, you know, with different ideas of things to do and he would direct me to different companies that I might be interested in working for in New York City of which then I did mm. your, uh, sis your sister bondage seemed... and domination films by the way okay. what was what I was okay. directed towards. all right um you mentioned your sister earlier she seemed to not be so supportive as you were climbing the ladder uh, how did it feel with her attitude towards you as you started to do bigger and better things in the wrestling business did, did her attitude towards you get even more jealous or uh... well she she uh went to the power plant actually okay she had a, a great big affair with terry taylor and uh you know Ooh. thought that it was going to become something so mm -hmm. uh when she found out that it, it really didn't develop into anything uh, which it was for several years, uh, it, you know, she she wrestled for me when I later opened up my own promotions after ECW, and I brought her to wrestle with me for the NWA uh, several times and a few dates, and then after that, she uh, she got she got MS, so you know she just dropped off, and I was not uh, we were not always. We didn't see eye to eye. I, I would, you know, I would use her for the things she asked me to, and she used me for money and attention, and she never had my back. She never looked after me at all, uh, her or my brother, because my brother was there a lot as well. Okay. Uh, neither of them did anything to look after me as a sister or support me in any way. I had no guidance whatsoever. Is I was there, a very is, wild is there is there an anger on your end mm. at your parents, mm. at your sister, at your brother? I mean, you're a, a young Absolutely. woman that's finding her way in the world. And, you know, as a family, we're here to protect each other. Is there mm. anger to, at this point in your life? Well, the, the thing is, when, uh, when I got to the point and when, when I started to feel uncomfortable with how things were going... And I started to vocalize on it when I got home. I started getting uh, thrown out of my house. So I was left, uh, at the times that I wasn't at wrestling events, I was left out on the street, homeless, like as a child. When I was supposed to be in school otherwise, um, I would go to anyone's house to sleep on anyone's couch. And if a wrestler had a bed available, I was sleeping in it. Um, it, that, and that's pretty much how my my life went from the time I opened my mouth about what my problems were. You, you know, like any time I issued a complaint of, you know, I got assaulted, I feel like this shouldn't have happened, or I think I got raped, and, and then explain the situation, I was told to shut my mouth. You know, I was told by local police in my area, you know, you, you go talk to your father with this, you know, and shut your mouth in the meantime. I got put in mental institutions because my father turned against me later in life when I really uh, realized that all of this was wrong. Right. And um, I, I, we had a, a bunch of properties lined up and I happened to be the one right next to him and he was had holes in the walls and microphones all over my house and had me followed by detectives and put away it was quite the situation but they put me out of the house and made me homeless from when i was a teenager because i was complaining about this kind of behavior so for a while i withdrew and i would not complain and i would not talk about it and I held a lot of it in for a long time because I figured, you know, it, 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 it could get worse than not having anywhere to stay. And then it progressively did get worse. So um, my family was never supportive. And I, I, I think things would have went a lot different if, you know. You may I, I ask, I might have missed this. I'm sorry. How did Todd Gordon treat you and how did Paul Heyman treat you? Todd is wonderful. 
Todd's a fantastic person. Todd also knew my father for a very long time and has known me since I was a child. Um, Todd is still to this day, as a matter of fact, a couple days ago was very forceful about how I'm coming to a, a convention to sit with him in the Sandman. And, <laughs> you know, I, I keep telling them that that's not, you know, it's not going to happen. And it's not particularly because I, I had a problem with him in ECW. It was because of the other people that were there and, and how I find it irritating. But I love Todd. Um, never, never problem with Todd at all. Angel, when you started working with wrestlers in the ring, especially in ECW, did you find any of them taking advantage of you in the ring? Oh, sure. I mean, I was an 18, just 18 years old being picked up a, a move that was never done before in the ring. I was a, a, like a, a rag doll of experiment for getting picked up by a guy that they were at, at billing as seven foot tall and 300 and whatever pounds and choke slamming me to the ground and, you know, really legitimately hurt my neck. And then um, anyone who had it done after that, it was like a big joke for them to wear a neck brace because I actually needed one. You know, I actually got hurt with that and it was like you know and the thing is even hurt i continuously let i did i let them do it again and again and again and again because you know at that point that was my position and uh you know i was at, at first i started out as one thing and i went through a phase of being a singles wrestler and red white and blue and doing this thing with sherry martell and then being the fucking cut up doll as no other woman would want to get naked or have her head mutilated in any way but that was me at 18 years old mm -hmm. i was the one bleeding from my head and getting my clothes ripped off and being choke slammed by guys of 15 times my size as a child still 18 years old is to call it what you want but it's still a child especially when it's a hurt child you know uh so progressing through ecw after i was uh you know had my top ripped off and then um i managed rebel for a minute and and then um you know, we, we had a situation with the head cheerleader. I was the first head cheerleader in the triple threat with Shane Douglas and Curtis Hughes. Right. And that was all to uh, choke slam me in every single match that they could get in that year and then get me to uh, help train Francine then to take my place. Uh, so that was my head cheerleader role at that point. I was also dressing everyone in the locker room, making costumes and doing people's hair, including Public Enemy, which I don't get enough credit for. I did all their costumes. I, I did their hair and, and was in charge of doing people's makeup when they got beat up and would need bruises or, or b extra blood or, you know, need ashes for something set on fire. I was doing props and everything that needed to be done in the locker locker room on the barking of Paul Heyman. Do this and do that and they come to the studio and help me edit this and be a voice for that and you know, it would take my suggestion and then give me absolutely no credit for any of it. Angel B40 out there is asking, does it make you sick seeing Mick Foley white knighting all of these young female wrestlers? It seems to be gimmicker. Gimmickerish. Gimmickerish? Gimmick or rush? Thank you. Yeah. Is he, That's okay. why you're the star is, of the show. Is he full of poop? I, the, I'm glad that this question was asked because uh, this leads me to my later activities. It does make me sick what Mick Foley has put himself out there to try to be mm -hmm. uh, with this uh, rape and incest national network. Uh, it, they should not even associate with themselves with someone who had sexual contact with me when I was 14 and 15 years old. Now, like I said before, I told this story on many a podcast that got taken down. You know, when things happen and you're seeing the tail end of someone leaving a room and you have semen on you, that person did something to you. 
So that's why I say 14. I won't stay silent on 14, but you damn right well know, Mick Foley, what happened when I was 15 years old, okay? And it doesn't matter that I may have had sex with two other people that same day. Yes, I did have sex with Chris Von Erich and, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Kevin Von Erich and Chris Adams. I did because I was a very um, confused, drugged up teenager who by then um, had a unbelievably strong sexual appetite after Goldschlager and some cocaine. So uh, you know what you did, and Kevin Von Eric knows what he did, and Chris Adams also knows what he did, all in that same day. So it look at me like I'm bad for it, but I was intoxicated, okay, uh, by people who brought the shit to me, and then I was encouraged to do it, and not only and encouraged to do certain things in a way, Mick Foley, that you knew damn right well that I did not want to do, okay, um, I'm, and I'm not, we, we throw words around here, and uh, certain words need to be attached to other words, because when you're underage, that word means something else than what it is, but um, sometimes when you're talked into things, it the coercion seems a little bit like that word I'm not supposed to be using right now, Correct. which I'm not going to. Thank you. Because I do, I do find it. I personally find it a different situation. I really do. For the people that actually uh, did the activity, that I don't want to say the four-letter R word that we all want to dance around here was oh, actually the, the ultimate warrior did that. He actually did that four-letter R word to me, and so did Brian Pillman. Okay, so I hold nothing back when I say that those people were forceful and harmful to me in my life and never once uh, acknowledged or gave an apology towards it and then want to act like they're friggin' some superstars and holier than thou, like they should be worshipped and they're friggin', uh, you know, a, like do, doing inappropriate things with young children and they should all be ashamed of themselves. And, I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't want to voice my opinion on how I feel about people being deceased or not, but there's some people that karma just comes around on. Angel, how hard is it for you, considering this day and age of the Internet and the sensitivity, like a hangnail can cause an Internet meltdown, how hard has it been for you to deal with the, black, the backlash of what you're trying to tell? Well, I have... Um, I, I actually protested Mick Foley at a book signing in 2017 after years of uh, being a participant in pro wrestling in many different organizations, being an MMA fighter, an actress, a model, uh, being an, a promoter, and, and being in all different areas of professional wrestling. Uh, then I get to the point in 2017 where I found it offensive, where I was hearing what was trying to be put out as bullshit from Mick Foley's mouth. So I went to his book signing when he was trying to put himself off the Santa Claus and let him know and anyone else who would listen know that that man in there, uh, I, I called him some choice names of what I consider him to be for having sex with a 14 or 15 year old girl. I use those words to describe him because that is what I think of him. And if other people think otherwise, a 15 year old probably should not be having sex with a 25 year old. If you disagree with that, then there's something wrong with you, not me. Is there any, is there any hero in a story like anybody, like Tommy Dreamer, did Tommy Dreamer come to your rescue? <laughs> Tommy Dreamer whacked me so hard between my legs with a cane in my private area that that I told this story many a times. That cane disfigured me. I'm still disfigured. That cane um, it clamped around the skin of my private part let's call it and stretched it and made it a, a, a big open wound for months at a time and that was my exit of ECW that I was put into a position as the virgin princess out of a joke to make so that I could get caned by Mick Foley in a match in ECW and then after I got caned by Mick Foley Tommy Dreamer picked the cane up and opened my legs 
after he kicked me in my face and stomped me a few times, which was unplanned and unnecessary, uh, he hit me with it and I got an injury to uh, my private part. And then I was called back. I, I wasn't about to go back after that. Um, because there were some things going on behind my back in the locker room that I had understood, you know, I was running local shows and different things were going around about the things that I was saying about people and, you know, people started like, you know, not want me around. So, um, I, I was staying home, but after a few months I got a good Paul call me and he said, listen, I need you at the arena. Could you bring your wedding dress? You know, I had been injured for you know, a while. I couldn't work out or anything. I had gained a massive amount of weight. I couldn't fit into my wedding dress. So I had to go out and get a new one. Um, so I show up at the arena against my father's will that then I just had started talking to him back then because he seen what they had done to me and he told me not to go back. So I, against his will, I actually went back and, um, and then lost a place to live after the show because my dad found out that I went back. And um, then got into in, involved in an angle with the Pitbulls and Jason and uh, Hack Myers that they now play on WWE as some kind of singles match. And I got pile driven the wrong way. You could see that I, I was so hurt at the time. I couldn't even lift my legs for the pile driver. It, it, like from the waist down was totally damaged from what Tommy Dreamer did. So I could barely move to even get in the ring, let alone take uh, a move. But I took the move, and then that was my last show in ECW. Uh, after doing every position that there was in, in that company for people and taking a lot of shit, that was how I got sent off um, in ECW. And now they use it in WWE as, as a singles match, and uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't get to see because I don't have WWE network, network. But people tell me about it all the time. It's only so, nine, um, it's only nine ninety nine. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not paying to see myself. I was there. Yeah. I got pictures. Of it. I know yeah. what happened. All right, so Angel, I have to challenge you with this, right? You, you, you had these problems, but and these, these are these are serious accusations, and certainly not to be made light of, but. Then I see you on Jerry Springer, and then I think to myself, well, does she just want to be on TV? Uh, I'm trying to figure that one out. Like, why do you end up going on Jerry Springer? Okay, so uh, to try to wrap that up as quickly as I can, uh, when I was in apartment wrestling, when I got put into that when I was a child, my name got changed to Tara Titanium, Mistress Tara Titanium. So for a long time, uh, people knew me as a, a few different people. There's many different people that I represent, and Tara Titanium was one of them. And uh, it, back at when, after I worked, uh, you, you know, for in a few films, and I was in some magazines, uh, Man Man Pondo, and I started doing Thumbtack Death Matches, which was the first of their kind at the time. In uh, Cleveland, we started off, and then it, for the Insane Clown Posse and Hellfire Wrestling, uh, we did all that stuff. Then Pondo set me up with uh, the, the Jerry Springer show initially. You know, they were interested in the story from uh, one of the producers who I'm on Facebook with now saw me, and uh, she asked Pondo if he knew me, and he said, yeah, and they called me on a three-way, and we conference called, and I was out there the next week. Uh, doing a show not about wrestling but about who Tara Titanium is and uh, which is a, a dominatrix who treats people like animals so uh, for attention yes because uh, that that area of my life actually not w was not only a childhood uh, performer uh, it, but actually was a, it was an actress later on and uh, produced several films in uh, different areas. I owned my own business under that name and, and ran a dungeon. I worked for Hellfire uh, Club in New York City as a child as Tyra Titanium. 
I did adult films with Blake Mitchell, uh, a star of Titanium, um, all within a spam. And, and I also was star of Titanium in women's extreme wrestling. And um, previous to that, I worked for the revival of Glow, Gorgeous Ladies of Outrageous Wrestling. And um, I was just doing it as Angel, but then, uh, you know, some people took over and they actually asked me to change my name and be Tower Titanium. So then uh, it's come around about 2002, from 19, I'm sorry, 2000 to 2002 or so, uh, brought that back in adulthood in pro wrestling as Tower Titanium. Tell me about the video angel pays the bills okay that was a film that i was directed towards a gentleman named mark ross he told me you're i'm sorry i i hope i could say this your jewish boyfriend gave me your phone number do you want to make some money he was referring to paul Heyman. Boy. so uh, anything that uh, he he used to send me different work uh, with people that did videos like mixed wrestling and bondage and all that stuff because when we had sex he used to smack me around and then insisted that I like it and convinced me that I did and eventually it's what I ended up you know doing for a living so uh, he sent me uh, to Mark and Mark and I filmed with a cast of people who then after they turned off before I turned 18 who uh, then at, after they turned off the cameras put me on a rotating wheel like we were at a friggin circus and were flinging uh, cigars at me and, and, like and really weird stuff it was really weird stuff I was uh, not of age at the time still and people you know who you are, Rob Feinstein, whether or not you want to admit it, but people were selling that video at ECW shows, uh, you know, while I was there. And then they still sell it on the internet right now. Okay, this is going to be a strange one. This The State Athletic Commission back in those days was quite valid. Uh, how did Paul Heyman, uh, you know, license you? How did you get through the cracks back in those days? You had to report to the State Athletic Commission back in the early 90s. I'm just curious. Well, I... Frank, Frank the Tank here, Frank Talent was the State Athletic Commission pretty much. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't remember dealing too much with Frank other than him joking around, okay. you know, and making sexual comments. I don't remember. <laughs> I, like, I got, uh, yes. I got licensed by Larry Hazard in the okay. state of New Jersey, okay. and I'm licensed in other states, but right. as Pennsylvania, I was actually, at any time I ran shows, I was actually an outlaw promoter. Even though I ran under the NWA right. license, right. I was still considered an outlaw promoter, because wow. I didn't give a shit about State Athletic Commission. Got you. All right, so you have a beautiful daughter. Uh, I, I, I think you're married, am I correct? Yes. How does your Number family <laughs> deal with what happened to their mother, and how are you able to keep this somewhat mm. under control? My daughter, um, she's a very, very strong person. She was always a straight-A student, honor rolls, all the way up until she graduated Temple University for film. So uh, she, she makes a go of it. And uh, she's she knows the entire story. Her father, I met also around wrestling. Mm -hmm. uh, he was actually why I, I stopped all the, let's call it ring rattery, if you will. Uh, we met when I was 15 after an incident with Ric Flair chasing me away, um, pretty much. And so I, I met my husband when I was 15 and we got uh, married and I had my daughter. My husband was, I think, 23 or 24 at the time. So my daughter technically is, is a product of, of, of the four letter R word with, you know, the other word attached to it. And she knows this. Um, this has been acknowledged. We, we got married and divorced very quick. And um, but we always kept in contact and uh, tried to keep on good terms until the day that he died. 
Well, Angel, um, I mean, this, this interview could probably go on for eight hours. Uh, for sure. Probably more. I've tried I'm, it. I'm, and a, it I'm, I'm a little lost for words. Mm. I, you know, um, Angel, do you hate wrestling at this point? How, how can you even watch it after hearing some of the things? I don't. I don't watch wrestling. I I cannot hear Paul Heyman's voice on a television. It still makes me sick to my stomach. Mm. Um, I, I I watch very little TV actually. I do more live streaming okay. and videos and um, a lot of video work and modeling work and, and whatnot that I could get into. I don't watch a whole lot of uh, TV at all, let alone wrestling. Um, it's it's not. So, I, I get the clips that people send to me on the internet. And whoever sends me their match to watch, I will watch and review things. Sure. Uh, but I'm not going to sit down every week and watch a program. I haven't been able to do that since the 90s. Right. Because at Paul Heyman's suggestion, by the way, just to not have influence by other people, which I never needed anyway because I have uh, enough to go around. Yep, one in Kabillion. Yep. All right, so, Angel, we're going to hit you with the Pharaoh's final question. This is unscripted. It comes out of his head. Unscripted. I don't know what he's going to ask you. Uh, so, Pharaoh. All righty. Angel, first of all, thank you. I'm sure it's not easy to, to uh, talk about and share this with the folks at home. So thank you for that. Um, what do you hope to accomplish by speaking out? Do you think that there'll be justice one day, or do you just feel like, I have to say this? The more I say this, the more ears will possibly hear. What do you hope to accomplish by telling what, what you went through? You know, the sad thing about this is that I've been talking about it for so long on so many different platforms, and I've seen how not only has it resulted in stalking and gang stalking and cyberbullying and whatnot to the point where, you know, people wanted me to stop talking about it, and even lawyers sent me papers to stop talking about it. And um, I will not stop talking about it, uh, regardless of whether or not I think it's really going to do anything, because I, I really don't think that things are in all order in this world to really address things like what I'm talking about, the four letter R word and uh, people in the entertainment industry who get away with literally get away with murder when they want to and get away with things the, the way they did to me. And um, I just, I, I, wanna, I wanna put it out there as just making people understand that these people are human beings and like very much like myself, they've made many mistakes, but it's not fair for them to try to uh, put those mistakes on a child. It's not fair for them to represent themselves as saviors when they're very much far from that. So um, if people could just realize that there's, there's evil in everyone's heart, and then sometimes people are not even doing it to be evil and they don't even know. But uh, there's bad things out there and bad things happen to people. Um, and be aware because it could happen to you. Angel, my final question to you. Is there forgiveness in your heart for what happened throughout your life? Well... With something that I have to live with every single solitary day of my life and the way people won't listen and they don't understand and continuously attack me for it, uh, maybe, maybe if someone said they were sorry, you know, one out of the rest that are alive that I can rattle off the names of right now, but I won't because I think I've made my point. But you all know who you are and, um, you know, maybe it just, I'm sorry would suffice uh, even though you probably belong in jail so should I forgive you no do I forgive you fuck no 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 I don't forgive them I don't forgive any of them Angel where could people catch you where could they catch your shows uh, again thank you again for spending this Thursday night with us and our family wow. uh, it's been an honor we appreciate you being so candid. Uh, Angel, where can people see you? I am on Instagram at Angel Amoroso for you. I am also on YouTube at Angel Amoroso, Angel Amoroso versus Mare Moo YouTube. 
Uh, I'm also on something called Dirty uh, Dead Doll Productions, if you want to catch me over there. And also on Variety Vault, and that is on YouTube and Twitch. I'm also on Facebook doing live streams constantly. I have 20 episodes of Fuck You Mick Foley, if you'd like to get over there and see that. Otherwise, I'm on Tumblr, Twitter, and, and just Google me and you can find me. Oh, also on Monty and Faro. There you go. Pub. That's what we're Every looking for. Sunday cheap pub. At 7 p.m. Join me then. <laughs> me and the Iron Man, Tommy Cairo. We're just bringing you through the history of professional wrestling from one episode to the last. All right. Well, we'll see you Thursday, Angel. We'll talk soon. Thank you again. Yes. Thank you, guys. Have a great night. Thanks, Angel. All right, Jimmy. Good guest. Interesting guest. Uh, I think this is the first time in the show, in the history of the show, yeah. that people have asked this show to go on for four hours, but I, I, yeah. know, I know Spidey doesn't want to hang in there. Spidey's got hours. three hot dates in the next they four wanted, they, they wanted this show. About? They wanted this show to continue. There's some very oh interesting my God. comments. Um, oh, my God. All very positive. Good. Um, good. It's about damn time. Good. That's good. Thoughts? Thoughts. I'm wrestling skull fucked. And you want thoughts. I, I don't know what to think about anything anymore. I wonder if I even like pro wrestling. If they hear somebody's... I don't know, dude. I don't know. You know what it's I something like... I have to digest, and it's a lot to digest. You know what I can and think I'm, of? I'm kind of sickened. Go ahead. What do you got? No, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm just kind of sickened by the whole thing. I, You know, it's terrible. When you grow up loving something, and I'm sure she had to go through this herself. She, she must have loved wrestling. You grow up loving something, and when you hear things like this... Not, it doesn't just break your heart. It screws up your head, and it makes you wonder why you like it in the first place. So honestly, that's what I'm thinking right now. That's what I'm thinking right now. What a horror show. All I can think about is the song, We Don't Need Another Hero. And mm. I was thinking, Farrell, could you send us out singing? I can't we sing don't, We Don't Need that's, Another Isn't that hero. like Tina Turner or something? Can you do it I in the Farrell voice? Bartman. Can you do it in the Farrell we voice? We don't need another hero. All right, well, send this out. All right, we don't need another hero. And what we really don't need is to hear me sing. We don't know. We don't need another way home. <laughs> I don't know all the words. There are no heroes. I'm a Black Sabbath fan. There are no heroes. No, not apparently not. Apparently not. And like I said at the beginning of the show, be careful, folks, because your heroes are human too. You've been watching Monty and the Pharaoh. Love each other. Do the right thing. Later.